Well, good morning. I hope that you are very thankful for the Lord's work and uh, it's filling you with hope. You know, last Sunday, Easter Sunday, we had almost 2,500 people here, one of the largest attendances in faith church history. And that's a result of so many gospel opportunities that are occurring uh, throughout the ministry. And we're just seeing the Lord work in amazing ways in both individuals and in family lives. Well, our annual theme is hope for everyday life. Sometimes it's easy to live with hope when you see the Lord work in exciting ways. But our series in 1 Peter has also reminded us that we can have hope when we face challenges and suffering. Life is not always easy, and our culture is not always friendly toward, well, those of us who believe like we do. So when it is hard, what do you do? You go back to the basics. You run back to what you know. You find stability before you tackle the difficult questions and challenges. You get your bearings. You understand the situation before you make decisions. And with that in mind, I invite you to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Peter 4, verse 1. That's on page 182 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you. And if you do not own a Bible then we'd encourage you to just write your name in that one and then take it with you. We want everyone who wants a Bible to have one. Peter's audience had it rough. They were living in a culture that did not value Christians. They Living for Christ had a price, and Peter wanted them grounded. And so we're talking this morning about one of the grounding principles of our Christian faith, kind of like home or base in a game of tag a place to catch your breath, to refocus, and determine the next steps. So the title of this message is Living for the Lord's Will. Living for the Lord's Will, 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they're surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. The overall point at the beginning as well as at the end was live for God's will amid suffering. Verses 1 and 2, the sentence culminates in for the will of God. At the end of verse 6, for the will of God. It is the grounding, especially in the midst of suffering as a Christian. And would you agree with me that there has been at least one time in your life where you have tried to do something for Jesus? I mean, you prayed in advance. You rehearsed even a few passages of Scripture in your mind. You prayed, and then you got blasted for whatever you did. Maybe it was a child a parent, a teacher, a friend, a student, a boss, an employee, a coworker. You try to do something for the best of your ability, and what happens? You suffer for it. Well, what happens when you have to live like that on a daily basis? Well, then you need a place to quiet your soul, a place for rest and reflection. And here, the focus is to do that You live for the Lord's will. You live for the Lord's will. You remind yourself again to live for the Lord's will rather than in constant fear of what might happen next. Or or you don't focus on everything that you wish was different. But that sort of begs the question because Peter, in essence, is saying, well, live for the Lord's will. But he doesn't tell us exactly what it was. Okay, so what what is that? He's assuming you and I already know what the will of God is. 
Sometimes we, as Christians, make it more complicated than what it is. Living for the Lord's will, at first, is simply following the commands that He's given. So here's some of them that we find in 1 Peter. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. There's a command. Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1.22, it says, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purify your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Here's the command. Fervently love one another from the heart. Or in chapter 2, we saw like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word. Long for the pure milk of the word. There's the command. So that you may grow by it in respect to salvation. Or later on in chapter 2, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. And instead, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Or or one more, in chapter 3, verse 15, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Each of these represent commands, and we could highlight several more of them. They illustrate not only what we're to believe, but also how to think, how to love, how to behave. God's will relates to our heads our hands, and our hearts. That means a significant part of God's will has already been given to us. And so it stabilizes our thinking, gets us back to basics, even in the midst of some hard situations. But you might ask, well, wait a minute, what happens in those times where I don't have chapter and verse to tell me what to do in this particular instance? Well, God has given us wisdom when we ask Him in each other, in the conscience that He has given us, in the Spirit of God which guides us according to His Word. Here, the challenge isn't so much whether we're open to God's, whether God will provide wisdom, it's whether we're open to it or not. Because after all, sometimes we say, okay, Lord, I'm coming to you with open hands. And then there are other times we say, okay, Lord, I want you to approve the plan I already have. See, he's given us a lifetime worth of work already in the Lord's will. And Peter assumes that we know it. Well, if we're dedicated to that, then here's what the text does gives us a couple of ways to strengthen our determination to obey God's will. If that's true, that we can and want to obey the Lord's will, then Peter provides a few ways to especially accomplish that. The first one is to arm yourself with the same purpose as your Savior. In verse 1, it starts off with, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh... Arm yourself with the same purpose. That's the same purpose as Christ. The therefore returns us back to chapter 3, verse 18, where Peter had explained the suffering of Christ. And as he reflected on that, he was highlighting for us then the practical implications. Have this attitude, the same one, the same intention, the same purpose. Live for the Lord's will just as Jesus did. And when we go to the Gospels, we find words like this. Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing of my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. Or we find a passage like this. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Over and over, Jesus highlights that He has come to accomplish what God has given Him. His only desire is to be obedient to his Father. And what Peter says is, take on that mission. Take on that mission. Arm yourself with that purpose. Be obedient to the Father's will. And that's going to involve resolving to follow Christ's suffering. Now, 
he's highlighting here the suffering that comes from the societal pressures of actually wanting to live for Jesus in a real meaningful way. You know, over the last week, we've been especially focused on Christ's suffering. And yes, there was a painful death, but there was also a lot of ridicule. And Jesus told his followers that if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross and deny yourself and then follow him. And those who expressed other priorities, you know, like, hey, can I just wait until my father dies, and then I'll come follow you after that? Jesus said, "Uh, no. No, I I have to have the priority. The first priority is me. It's so tempting to focus on ourselves, and yet what his stake is is, follow me. Just like I chose to follow the Father, I had to give up the things that I wanted in some cases in order to accomplish what the Father wanted. That's a resolution. And it may be that it would be helpful for some to say, you know, I need to do that in my heart right now. I have not been living for the Lord's will to the degree that I should. And I know it. And my takeaway from this message is I'm going to resolve to follow the Lord's will. I'm going to do what he wants. And let me just say to to young people and to the parents who are seeking to help these young people, I hope that would be your heart's desire. That you would say, I want to do with my life whatever the Lord wants me to do with my life. And so I, I'm not worried about the, the career choice necessarily as much as I'm worried about what God wants me to do. So if he wants me to follow this path, then I'm open to that path. My hands are, are open. My life is yours. Lord, you just lead and direct. And then I'm going to do whatever it is that you want me to do with passion and excitement. Now, arming ourselves is also going to mean choosing God's will over the temptation to sin. The hardest phrase in this particular passage to understand occurs at the end of verse 1. It says, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I'd say, what? Is he talking about Jesus? Did Peter just say that Jesus sinned in the flesh and stopped when he died? And what's the answer? No, he did not say that. And the grammar is actually clear in that the he who suffered is not referring to Jesus, but to the believer who has to arm himself or herself with the purpose of following Christ through suffering. You say, okay, well, that helps some But did it it just say then that believers, when they suffer, they become sinless? No, that's not what it says either. So I'd say, okay, I give. What does it actually say? Peter is actually doing something wonderful here. And I, I just love this. He's saying that when we prepare ourselves, we arm ourselves to following Christ's example... We're purposely choosing the path of Christian ridicule rather than the path of sin, which pleases and honors the world. This is when I make this resolution, then I'm willing to follow this path as opposed to follow the path the world wants me to. So when we say we're willing to suffer as a Christian, if that's what God is going to require because we want to live faithfully for him, then we're also making the decision not to live for what pleases the world, to be dead to the world. Reminds me of an old hymn. I don't remember the last time we sang it, but as I was preparing, it just popped in my mind. Many of you will remember this. I have decided to follow Jesus. Remember how that last little phrase went? No turning back, no turning back. One of the uh, verses said this, the world 
behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. I read this week that a judge upheld that the Brownsburg school system did the right thing when they forced a teacher to resign his position because he believed that using transgender metaphors for his students did not honor Jesus and was a violation of his faith. Maybe you saw that article as well. Now, I don't know what you think about that case and whether it was the right decision, but there were two clear conclusions that I drew from that article. The first one is it reminded me that our public school teachers who attend here and churches like ours face some pretty intense pressure. So it gave me an opportunity just to pray for our public school teachers, knowing that any teacher who calls our church their home could face that exact same question, exact same pressure. It was either use this, these names and these pronouns or you're fired. That was the choice. The second thing, the second conclusion that I drew was that teacher had resolved in his heart to follow Christ as he believed it was, to, to be his will, even if it meant suffering. He was willing to follow what he believed God's will was in his situation and was willing to take the pressure and the ridicule that came with it. Because let me tell you, the article was not standing up for the teacher. You know, amid suffering, our base, our home, has to be, I'm going to follow the Lord's will. I'm going to follow the Lord's will. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to arm myself. I know I'm going to have to go to some form of war. Now, here's the second way. No longer live for the desires of men, but for the will of God. You say, well, that's similar to what you just said. Yes, I know. However, I want to draw attention to the phrases. Here's what it says. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Notice this here, right here. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. It's already been sufficient. He says, in essence, our time for sin is over. We've sinned long enough, been there, done that. Understand where it leads. We had perfected it long enough, Peter says. You've been good at it long enough. And you know, it's not too hard to look at that list and say, you know, I think Peter got it right. A chorus of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. You can just sort of go through the list and say, yeah, I've probably done that. Yep, yep, yep. I guess been there, done that, don't need to do it anymore, huh? As Peter's take. He's encouraging us to say, you know, when you get into the battle, there's always this press back into the old life. There was a side of it that was fun, but it also brought death. So now we have to work at it. We got to fight the battle. In Romans 6, Paul wrote these words, you are dead to sin and alive to God. And I think that's a, a little helpful phrase that we can use when we're tempted to sin. I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. But Peter adds another phrase in this passage. He doesn't talk about us being dead to that as much as he tells us that we're done with that. We've already done it. So there's no more need to go back to doing it again. 
So in the midst of temptation, not only can we say, I am dead to that, we can say, I am done to that. So when we feel the pool, when there's a sense that something valuable might be there, he gives us some encouragement to say, here's how to fight. You say not only that you're dead, you say you're done. Then we're reminded that in all this, some are surprised that you don't run into the same excesses. In other words, some are surprised. Oh, I forgot to give you that. We're followed. We, we follow these desires long enough. Then verse 4, although some are surprised that we do not join them. They're surprised. Now, I want to think about a couple of ways this could play out. One way is that we actually had a series of friends or co-workers, acquaintances, that we did these things with. And then we came to Christ, and then we stopped doing them, and they're like, what's wrong? We used to do that. Why aren't we doing that anymore? And so they are, at first, surprised. Another category is that people come into our lives that we didn't know previously, but their assumption is that we have the same values that they have. So maybe we get into a new circle through a job or through moving or through some other circle of influence, and their assumption is that we live like they live. And so what happens? Well, they invite us to all kinds of things because they're, they don't know that we don't do those things. And it's not until they find out that we're boring Christians who don't do anything that they change their mind. And then comes the, the maligning, right? And it's sometimes subtle, isn't it? I remember back in the day when I worked as a software engineer and you know, you'd go to work, and at first people didn't know who I was. They didn't know anything about me, and so I got invited to all kinds of stuff. And, you know, I, I, I won't tell you all the stories. But anyway, they got invited to all sorts of things. Well, then they figured out that, oh, he's the goody two-shoe pastor, wannabe, who's writing computer programs. So then anytime anyone would swear, it's like, there's a future pastor sitting right there. Now, they're just, they're picking at me, right? Oh, sorry about that. I didn't realize I would mess with your, your, your tender heart. Well, what are they doing? They're mocking, right? Just, just a little subtle pressure, a little bit of maligning. Now in our cancel culture, now you're an ignorant, bigoted, misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, judgmental, holier-than-thou individual, which justifies them saying or doing whatever they want. So the question becomes, will we fold? Will we collapse? Will we give in to the pressure? Will we try to straddle the, fr the fence so that we can be, well, just as much like them as possible without being totally like them? I think Peter's just illustrating a better plan. Just live for the will of God. Just live for the will of God. You know, we, the, the, the pastors as well as many of, of you all, chose to serve during the Easter egg hunt on Saturday morning, last Saturday morning, to try to provide a, a, a fun event for the community to come out. And, well, somebody decided, I, I think they must have talked to one of the fun pastors. Somebody decided that we all needed to wear rabbit ears. Did you see that picture? Okay, like this one right here. Well, you, you know what's particularly funny about that picture is when the, the person who had this great idea handed me the rabbit ears. I didn't know this initially, but there were several others who were watching what I was going to do. <laughs> uh, apparently, I was the one who was the judge of sense and sensibility on that day. 
if I wore them, then they were going to wear them. And if I was going to rebel, then they were going to rebel too. Well, I decided to, to wear them. It actually turned out to be a great idea. Because as many people as were there that day, the people with the rabbit ears, you could tell they were the ones with the event. Like, oh yeah, those are the workers right there. Nobody just showed up with those kind of rabbit ears, <laughs> right? And we had a very simple job, simple job. Interact with as many people as possible and invite them to Easter service. That was the job. No one protested, no one was screaming. Instead, here's what happened. I'll tell you about a couple of my conversations. Spoke to one guy, brought his little one, he's now a grown man, asked him what his, how he knew about us. And he said, well, I used to come to the skate park here when I was in seventh grade. So here he was now, in his 20s, with a child, bringing that child to the Easter egg hunt because he thought this was a place that would welcome them. Another guy walks up to me, and he says, you guys have five ministry campuses, don't you? I about had to pick myself up off the floor. I was thinking, how in the world do you know that? Like, this guy knew not only about Faith East, Faith West, and Faith North, but he knew about restoration ministry, and he knew about the Hartford Hub. And I, I just asked him, how do you know that? There's probably 50% of our church that doesn't know that. <laughs> and he said, well, I, I like stalk you guys online. <laughs> he said, I just love what you have going on here. He said... And I would come to church here if I wasn't Catholic. Now, what do you think I said? You're allowed to come anyway, right? So I invited him, and who knows what will happen with these various interactions. But, you know, you could get all wound up about the people who are fussing at you or trying to ridicule you. Or you could just decide, you know what, we're just going to live for the Lord's will and let the Lord figure all the other stuff out. I taught this book a number of years ago in my ABF, and I created a little phrase that many in my classes thought was helpful. Here's what it said. Those who have no purpose struggle through or take their life. Those who have the wrong purpose waste their life. And those who have the right purpose are energized for life. Those who have no purpose struggle through or take their life. Those who have the wrong purpose waste their life. And those who have the right purpose are energized for life. I think there's an energizing way to live. And you know, as crazy and goofy as those were, this was part of the people that were served. And this is only looking in one direction. There's actually more people in other directions. Because you're just trying to live out the will of God. Just trying to get the gospel out in as many ways as possible. Trying to meet as many people as we can. Because that's what outreach requires. And then you, you don't worry so much about all of the pressure that comes. So we're talking about arming ourselves with the same purpose of our Savior, to live for the Lord's will. We're talking about no longer living for the desires of the flesh and for men, because we've been there and done that. There's no need to do that anymore. Here's reason number three. Know that living for God's will results in vindication. Verses 4 and 5 can also seem a bit confusing at first. It says, But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached, even to those who are dead, 
that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirits according to the will of God. But this verse is actually talking about victory and vindication. Remember that his audience was being pressed. There was not necessarily full-scale persecution throughout the entire area, but there would be societal pressure. There would be the, oh, you're the goody-two-shoe Christian people. Oh, we don't know that we like you very much. Now, as they were facing that pressure, then Peter says, I I want you all, meaning his audience, to understand this, that those who live for those evil desires, they will receive God's judgment. It's not an option. It's not like, well, maybe God will choose them and maybe they'll just get a pass. Oh, no. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. See, we're used to, in our world, deferred justice, or in some cases, injustice. It occurs at every level of life. A child is teased at school, bullied at school, for no other reason than the color of their hair or the body size that they have. And it's not right, but it happens. And because it's not right doesn't mean it all goes away. And it doesn't mean that that child ever receives justice. It can happen in the home. Why does one child seem to get away with more than a different child? Why do some couples seem to be able to have as many kids whenever they want to have children as they want, and other people can't have them at all? That sounds like injustice. Or somebody is passed up for a job opportunity or a job advancement that they're fully qualified for. For no other reason than, well, somebody else likes somebody else better. At times, we're so accustomed to either deferred justice or to injustice that we forget that God will one day judge the world. And the disobedient... The ones who seem to get away with it, how I'm going to make fun of you because you're a Christian, they seem to get away with it. And that gets discouraging. And if we're not careful, it can turn our eyes inward. And we can be more focused on ourselves and the injustice or the hardship that we are receiving. Friends, This is a passage that reminds us none of those things are beyond God's vision. God sees it all. And God brings about justice. And that's why this is a good time to mention, if you don't have a saving relationship with Jesus, if you're still in the group that is surprised and maligns, the Bible is clear that God The Lord is patient, waiting for you to come to repentance. But please don't interpret God's patience as God doesn't care, or God is not real, or God is not going to fulfill His promises. This is a reminder that everybody stands to give an account. In 2 Thessalonians, it says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Here he's talking about punishment for the wicked. And to us as well, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. In other words, we see the two sides of God's judgment. We see vindication for the righteous, that is, final relief for the righteous, and then punishment for the wicked. D. 
dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Please notice the language. It's only right for God to judge. His judgment has two sides, always. Relief for the righteous, vindication, victory, and punishment for the wicked. The gospel is not just a message. It's a command. And last Sunday, Pastor Virus was highlighting that very same point, that the gospel is a message and a command. It's not just that you are encouraged to acknowledge your sin and place your faith in Christ. It's that you are commanded to do so. And I realize that there might be some here who don't yet have a saving relationship with Christ. Well, I don't know a better day than this one to get that matter resolved. And if you need or want help, we're happy to meet with you even after the services this morning. Now, for his audience and for those who do have a saving relationship with Christ, he ends, those who live for God's will enjoy eternal life. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead. Though they were judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the uh, will of God. See, this verse speaks about the gospel message impacting those who had already passed away. Yes, they had suffered the pain of death, but they live in the spirit. So this is a passage emphasizing the resurrection of the dead. See, those who are not believers, they don't see the benefit of Christianity. Because what they see is the here and now. And the here and now is, well, a Christian still is susceptible to disease and to death, and they miss out on all the fun. We all saw in Nashville in that school shooting that neither the adults nor the children who were outside of those classrooms were protected by some special force field simply because they were a Christian. Six of them died. The unbeliever doesn't see any advantage. Well, if Christians die like non-Christians die, and if they experience the same kind of hardships that non-Christians experience, then what benefit is there? I don't see any advantage. And on top of that, if you actually live like a Christian who wants to live for the will of God, then there's going to be some level of ridicule that comes on you because you think this way and you hold these values. So why would I want to experience the ridicule? Why can't I just have fun with all of my friends? Some believers are swayed by that argument. You're right, I guess there's no advantage. And Peter wanted to remind his audience, oh, yes, there is. Oh, yes, there is an advantage. Oh, it's true. The world might say there's no advantage to being a Christian. Peter says, yes, there is. Because Jesus has conquered death. And judgment awaits those who refuse to obey the gospel and to continue living their lives for the lusts of people. But vindication and victory awaits those who hear the gospel and respond to it. Yes, the here and now, a Christian and a non-Christian can be harmed in the same way, but their focus is that they have very, very different endpoints. One lands in eternal destruction, and one lands in life, eternal life through the Spirit. 
that is really what Paul wrote when he emphasizes in Titus, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny godliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, having one eye here on the now and one eye on the future. So I want to close with asking ourselves, to what extent do we endure? Because no one likes to suffer. So if we're going to experience social ridicule, to what extent must we endure? Well, if Jesus is our example, then obviously that's going to land us to death. D.A. Carson is one of my favorite theologians. He's an elderly man now. But in 1990, he wrote the book, How Long, O Lord? And here were his words. The book is dedicated to discussing suffering from a Christian viewpoint. And he wrote, I would rather die than end up unfaithful to my wife. I would rather die than deny by a wasteful or given to lust life. His word was profligate. What I have taught in my books. I would rather die than deny or disown the gospel. There are some things worse than dying. I remember reading those words and they hit me like a ton of bricks. Like what a statement that was. There are some things worse than dying. You know, parents, we cannot control how our children are going to live, what they decide, what they will value. They will grow up and make those decisions for themselves. But let's resolve to live before them the will of God so that if they go astray, they have to walk over our dead, lifeless body to do it. Young people, if life is hard, Live for the Lord's will. Resolve to live for it, even if your parents won't. And all of us, live for the Lord's will. Do it faithfully. Give them a reason to think that this really is real. Peter says, live for the Lord's will arm yourselves. Say, you're done with that. You did that, done that, been there. It's over now. And remember that those who don't know Christ face the judgment. And those who do experience the blessing of eternal life with Him. So if God calls us to give up our lives, there are some things worse than dying. In the meantime, let's live for the Lord's will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And thank you for this short but very poignant text that just drives home this point that in the midst of challenge or hardship, live for the Lord's will. Make it simple. Live faithfully for you. And Lord, we need help to do that. Because we are drawn to the value, to the, the benefits that sin provides, especially in the immediate. And Lord, would you help us? Would you remind us that we have done enough? We have covered that ground sufficiently. We've been there, we've done that, and we don't need to do it anymore. So we're asking for your help in Jesus' name. Amen.